Today's scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. From chapter 11, Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us, and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition I will make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes, and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, what is wrong with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them into pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by hand of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. And the next day, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is it that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not the men shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingdom. From chapter 12, And Samuel said to the people, And when you saw that Nahash the king of the Ammonites came against you, you said to me, No, but the king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your king, and now behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him today and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sin this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you, but, he, but if you still do wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. These are the true words of the living God. Thanks, Grace. Good morning, guys. It's great to be with you this morning. It's great to be preaching the Word uh, to you today. Let's um, bow our heads and let's just pray as we, as we get started, asking the Lord to speak to us. Father, we need you to speak to your people. We pray, Holy Spirit, um, that you would feed Jesus' sheep, that your Word would encourage us, would convict us and challenge us, and that you would call and draw your people to obedience, the obedience of faith, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a time when you felt forsaken by God? One of my favorite movie images of this is from the Count of Monte Cristo. Edmond Dantes is framed by his best friend for a, a treason that he didn't commit. And Dantes is sentenced to a lifetime in prison on an island in the middle of nowhere while his friend goes on to marry his fiance, He steals uh, Don, uh, Edmond Dante's fiance, And after six years, 
in, co- in solitary confinement in this prison, Dante has given up his faith in God. He's at a po- the point of, of madness. He's ready to take his own life. Dante believes that God has forsaken him. So if you had a time where you felt forsaken by God, maybe there were circumstances that were so overwhelming that you felt God cannot be in control of this anymore. He must have given up on me. I'm on my own here. Maybe a period of loneliness and never feeling understood by others or or dealing with an extended uh, health issue, discouragement. Or maybe there's, there's this repetitive sin in your life that you commit again and again, and maybe that's made you feel that God has just given up on you. Maybe that's you today, and you feel, God can't help me. You believe there's no real hope of change in your life. In our passage, we see a city that feels forsaken by God because of an external enemy. We also see a nation who looks like they are forsaken by God because of all of their sins. So I've got two simple points in my sermon today. Firstly, uh, God will not forsake his people to their enemies. And secondly, God will not forsake his people to themselves. And then we'll look at how we respond to that. So first off, God will not forsake his people to his enemies. This is how the people of Jabesh Gilead would have felt as Nahash the Ammonite and his army surround the city. The The siege works are laid and their hope is running out If the Bible were a movie series, Nahash should be your typical evil villain. His name even means serpent. He's the serpent king, the original enemy of God's people. That's who he's named after. And Nahash's thing is gouging out people's eyes, making them look like pirates. Nahash wants to humiliate God's people. How will they respond? Well, their immediate response to hardship is to switch allegiance. In verse 1, They say, make a treaty with us, Nahash, and we'll serve you. There's no rousing speech. There's no hero to be found in Jabesh. Just spare our lives, and we'll serve the serpent guy. Nahash won't accept. He uh, drives a hard bug, and he says, look, you've got to give me a right eye too. So they ask for an extension. They ask for one more week to send out messengers um, that they might find help. And you might wonder why Nahash would agree to that deal, why he would agree to give them Uh, a week to send out messages um, and get help. Well, a siege in those days, it takes a long time. You basically just have to wait out your enemy, um, wait wait until they starve um, from not having any food or water left inside the city. So seven days really hurries things along for Nahash. Um, And a a week is not a long time. Jabesh is a, a border town. It's on the east of the Jordan River. It's not very close to the rest of the nation. It's quite far from um, for, from where Israel's king is, where the rest of their, their nation is. And so it's not, not a real risk in Nahash's mind. Israel's not going to bother for this little border city. And when nobody comes to Jabesh Gilead, it's just going to humiliate the city even more. Nahash, gets, um, Nahash is going to get what he wants. So think of those two, retrial, those two responses uh, to a trial as a Christian, though. To switch allegiance and, and make compromise under pressure or to run to others for help. What's missing in their response? Well, where is God? Where is God in the way that they're thinking about this trial? There's no sense of faith at Jabesh Gilead. Their fear and anxiety is understandable, but they don't even pray. The other really peculiar thing that stands out is, where is King Saul? Why don't they think of him? Didn't they just ask for a king to fight their battles? And Saul just became the king in the last chapter. Why aren't they at least seeking help from their king? Maybe they're like some of the doubters in chapter 10, verse 27, the the last verse just before this chapter, who say, how can this man save us here in Jabesh? Where is King Saul anyway? He's back home. King Saul's on his farm. Maybe he's still hiding from responsibility like in the last chapter, Maybe he's unwanted by Israel now that they've asked for a king and God has granted the king. Maybe they realize they don't really really want this guy anymore. Whatever the reason, Saul's not really leading the nation at this point. He's not even around when the messengers reach his hometown of Gibeah as the people weep 
at what's about to happen to Jebesh. And the text is asking, who is going to save Israel? Will God's people be disgraced? But Saul has this hero moment, and this is supposed to remind us of all the greatest and most terrible moments of the book of Judges. The Spirit of God rushes on Saul, just as the Spirit of God had rushed on Samson. Saul takes a yoke of oxen, and he cuts them into pieces. He sends them throughout all Israel. If you don't come out and fight with me, that's going to be your oxen next. And terror, terror comes on the people. Why? This whole story reminds them of the very worst moment in the whole history of Israel up until this point. Saul is summoning Israel the same way the, the, same way the Levite of Judges chapter 19 had summoned the people when he cut his wife into 12 pieces and sent them throughout the nation to each of the 12 tribes. He, he did this after she was raped and abused and murdered by a mob of men in the town of Gibeah. And at the time, it was like such a thing has never happened in all of Israel's history. How are we going to respond? What are you going to do about this evil crime? The cities are the same in this instance as well as, as that incident in Judges. Gibeah, where Saul hears the news, is where that crime took place. And Jabesh Gilead was also sacked by the, by the, um, by the army that gathered um, to bring justice for this crime because they were the only town that didn't come out and fight alongside Israel to cut off the Benjaminites. And so this is why the dread of the Lord really falls on the people, and the whole nation comes out to, to fight and save Jabesh Gilead alongside Saul. 300,000 men, 330,000 men, they show up just in time to save the city. But don't miss the point. King Saul is not their savior. The Lord saves his people from their enemy. The Spirit of God finds Saul. He finds them not leading Israel, but out in the field, just kind of doing his own thing. And the Spirit comes on Saul and makes him into a leader. The dread of the Lord comes on the people so that they actually gather and they come out and fight. And even Saul knows that it's the Lord who does this. Someone has a bright idea to, of what to do after the battle. In verse 12, they say, who is it that said, shall, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the man that we may put him to death. And this leads to the very highest point of Saul's life. Saul says, not a man shall be put to death today. For today, the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. The Lord has brought about salvation. Saul recognizes salvation is not because of him. It's in spite of him. This is the doing of God. God does everything. For salvation, he empowers Saul, moves the people to actually show up, and God grants the battle. And so God gets all the glory. He will not allow his people to be disgraced by the serpent king. He will not forsake his people to their enemy. Now, you might be here today, you may or may not have enemies like Nahash. But even if no one's threatening right now to tear out your right eye, we have enemies, our main enemy is Satan. And while Satan is not ultimately powerful in the world, he is at work in the world to oppress us, to deceive us, and to tempt us away from obedience to God. And the pressures that come with life, your kids are sick, work is unrelenting, relationships are difficult and complex, there's a temptation on us to compromise, to make excuses, for your short temper, to justify seeking comfort in pornography, to think that God has nothing to do with my life and my situation right now, and, that, and then just to take things into my own hands. Well, Jesus told us, right? In this world, you'll have tribulation. It's going to be hard, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Whatever you're facing, God does not forsake us to our enemies. Jesus said those words in the context of his death. But in those words, I have overcome the world. He's saying, I have defeated even death. 
I've overcome the grave. Nothing can separate us from his love. But often, I think we know this, right? God delays. He waits until the last hours of the night to rescue us, to supply courage. And we're called to just trust his words, to wait a few more moments, to hold on onto his promises of, um, of, of salvation, just a few more moments while we wait for his salvation to arrive. Edmond, Dante, Edmond Dantes had given up his faith in God in prison alongside any hope of rescue. He, was, he knew he was just going to live out his days and die there. But his rescue actually comes through a priest, another prisoner who dug a tunnel accidentally, um, trying to escape. He dug his tunnel into Dantes' cell. And there's this dialogue where, dialogue where Dantes says he no longer believes in God, and this priest basically says, yeah, well, God has not given up on you. He still believes in you. That's the way he says it. But God has not given up on you. And Dante's eventual deliverance and rescue from prison comes through that priest's death. He takes the, the priest's place inside the body bag, gets thrown off the island in his place, and he swings, he swims to his freedom. God had not even forsaken him. What Samuel takes issue with uh, in the response of the people of Jabesh Gilead in the next chapter, is they don't even cry out to God. That's, that's the main thing he's taking issue with in the city of Jabesh. We're called to an active faith in our affliction as we wait for God's deliverance. And what this looks like, what faith looks like, when we really are suffering, when we are under pressure from external enemies, from circumstances in our lives, what faith looks like is agonized prayer. Part of trusting and serving a Jesus is crying out to him as the one who helps us, the one who saves us. And in fact, not to cry out to God in suffering is essentially a denial in the pressures of, of life. It's a denial of the type of God that God says he is. We make God out when we don't cry out to him in those moments as if God doesn't care, as if God doesn't care about our affliction. Now, some of us hide under a belief in God's sovereignty. But our view of God's sovereignty, if, if we have a view of God's sovereignty, sovereignty that doesn't lead us to prayer, that's sometimes just an excuse to go on living however I like and to, and to just serve false saviors. We don't let God interfere with this part of my life. Heartfelt crying out to God in loss, in affliction, in unmet longings, in justice, is worship. We declare that God can and must save. Why else are so many of the Psalms in the Bible, like the majority of the Psalms, are lament. We're supposed to cry out to God, and He gives us words to cry out to Him um, in, our, in our pain and suffering. You know, there's this woman in church who is often asking Sarah and me for, for prayer, for her health, for work, for relationships. And honestly, on the outside, that could just look like complaining a lot of the time. But I've been really encouraged through this lady's faith, through praying alongside her, because I get to see the honesty and the boldness of her faith while she's going through everything that she is. She keeps on asking. And sometimes you look from the outside and that just looks ridiculous. She keeps asking God for the same things. And she asks honestly and boldly along with that. And that tells me God really is that good because God sustains her faith. He's able to sustain her through all that and not make her cynical, not make her prayerless. God will not forsake us to the enemy, but let's cry out to him. Cry out to him while we wait for him to deliver. We've heard that God will not forsake us to an external enemy, but Alexander Solzhenitsyn says, if only it was so simple, that there were evil people somewhere out there committing evil and all we had to do was just destroy them. But he says the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. So what about the enemy within? 
My second point, God will not forsake his people to ourselves. In verses 14 and 15, Samuel responds to Saul's victory by declaring, come, come, let's go to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. And then it says, Saul made, sorry, they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. Now, Gilgal was the place in Israel where they first encamped in the promised land. This is where they uh, circumcised the wilderness generation, the people who were, were born outside of Egypt but weren't circumcised all that time. Um, they entered the land and they, 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 they did the circumcision there. Um, and this is where they celebrated the first Passover inside of Canaan. And they're going there because Saul's kingdom, they need to renew, renew the kingdom. Saul's kingdom has a problem. Its occasion was Israel's idolatrous demand for a king. Israel and God are not in a good place in their relationship. So Samuel, Samuel's really saying, let's renew our allegiance to the Lord. Make Saul king before the Lord. Let's recognize God as our true king. Just like salvation is from the Lord, we recognize, hey, our true king really, our, our king is God. That, he, he comes first, before Saul, before any of these like, ways that, in which we try and save ourselves. Think of Saul representing the nation, bowing down and pledging allegiance to God as the true king. Saul recognizing, look, I'm just a, a vassal. Um, Israel kind of recognizing, look, this king we've put in place, you're the true king, God. He's, he, 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 he's just there as a representative, but you're the true king. So Samuel's calling for covenant renewal, for Israel to renew their commitment to the Lord. And the rest of the passage in chapter 12 is that covenant renewal ceremony. So God renews the covenant, and this has got three parts. He's going to show Israel their sin. Uh, he's going to make them fear, and then he's going to declare God's grace to them. Samuel's got this really roundabout way of showing them their sin. Your ESV Bibles have a heading, Samuel's farewell speech, um, because, if you like, Samuel is retiring as a judge. He's not dying. Um, he's still going to be around in the story for quite a bit longer, but he's not needed now that Israel has a king. And so he asks for complaints. Uh, this is like his retirement speech as, as, as prime minister. Whose ox have I taken? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I taken a bribe? And their answer is no one. You, you've, you've, you've not done any of those things. Nobody can fault Samuel's character as a leader. I think of politicians today that we might see around the world. It's so rare to have a leader that nobody, nobody in the nation can accuse of any form of corruption whatsoever. Samuel's record is impeccable. But then Samuel turns it on them from verse 6. I'm reading from verse 8 here. When the Egyptians oppressed your fathers, they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord. And so Sisera and the Philistines and the king of Moab fought against you. And Israel cried out to the Lord again, and said, we've sinned because we've forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and many other judges and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side. But when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said, no, but a king shall reign over us. You see the pattern? God has been faithful. He saved you again and again and again. Every single time your fathers cried out to, to the Lord um, when, they were, when they were oppressed, God delivered them and God, God saved them. But this time, this time you wouldn't even cry out to God. No, you said, just give us a king. That way we don't even have to bother crying out to God. Their problem ultimately is they're rejecting God as their king. They rebel against God's rule, and they serve other masters. Look at the number of times in the passage Israel would serve someone other than God. Nahash threatens. They say, please, we'll serve you, Nahash. Throughout Judges, they forsake God and serve idols, the Baals and the Ashtaroth. 
And then they demand a king so they can serve their king instead of God. They're rebels. They continually reject God. Their demand for a king is only Israel's latest attempt to usurp God's authority, God's rule over them. And their problem, their rebellion is, is our problem too. We sometimes think of sin as just breaking God's commandments, a lie of told, a flash of anger, a moment where we gave in to lust. But no matter how bad you feel about any of those things, as long as we only think of sin as just breaking God's commandments, we minimize our sin and we, we fail to really understand ourselves. This is the nature of sin. We are rebels against God. We think, who is God to tell me how to live? I'm in charge of my own life. I'm going to do things the way that I want. I can do what I want. Who has, who's God to, to have any say over this? We reject God's authority and we make ourselves kings. And just as God's people went through this cycle over and over again, rebellion against God cuts to the very core of our being. Think of the idea of, of following your heart, which is so popular um, in today's day and age. And I think we, we all do this to some, ex- to some extent, that you know best, not some authority, and their authenticity and happiness comes through following your innermost desires. But we, whenever we reject God's authority, whenever we throw off these things, we end up serving someone else. We always end up serving someone. We're never free of a master. Nahash, the Baals, the Ashtaroth, what, whatever our idols, following our innermost desires actually enslaves us. Our need for approval, our fear of failure, or our need for intimacy and love, which leads us through relationships, which leads us to demand more and more from people that they can't give us. Our desperate need to control our own lives that just leads to insecurity and anxiety. However we look to satisfy those innermost longings, we're never free of their demands but God does not forsake his rebellious people. God shows them their sin, and sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes we need to be shaken into seeing our sin. So God gives them this sign, this freakish weather event, harvest days, the driest time of the year. It's super unusual for rain to come, and it sounds like this is, this is an enormous downfall. This is just really out of out of, out of character for Israel in that time of the year. I know in Singapore, it's like, hey, you have a thunderstorm any time of the year, you can just have a thunderstorm. It's not unusual at all. Um, but in Israel, in dry season, that stuff just never happens. Thunder and, and rain. Rain is just going to ruin the whole wheat harvest um, and thunder alongside it. Israel needs to be scared into obedience. And the result, Samuel prays for this unusual weather event, and, and it happens, there's thunder and, the rain, and rain, the people greatly feared the Lord. They see their problem, and they confess their sin. Now, you might think of fear as a very Old Testament motivation, that God wouldn't frighten us like that anymore. He doesn't need to scare us into obedience. But Jesus frequently warned about hell. And for me, a number of years ago, I was so unwilling to repent of my sin that it was only through God convicting me through several Bible passages and just seeing some of the consequences of my own sin on other people that hell really is real. My sin really is that bad. And it was only through that that I finally took the gospel seriously and gave my life to Christ. If we continue in something that's clearly against God's commands, God might need to frighten us, even allow us to get hurt so that we take our own sin seriously. I'm not saying that's always the reason for suffering, but sometimes it is. And this is, this is just how far God will go not to forsake his own people, even to their own sin. When God scares us with the seriousness of sin, it's actually his kindness to us. He frightens us so that we might 
turn to him. Alongside thunder, he holds out grace, inviting us to take refuge in his son. Samuel shows them their sin to comfort them with God's grace. Verses 20 and 22, uh, he says, Do not be afraid. You have done this evil. Yes, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they're empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it's pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Do not be afraid. Yes, your sin is that bad, but don't be afraid. Why? For the Lord will not forsake his people. He, he, he won't forsake his people. He does this for his great name's sake. This is God's covenantal love for his people. His basis for loving them is not them, it's him. If God's basis for loving them was, it was just based on how faithful and good they are and they're just better than other people, they're slightly more obedient to God's commands, then their faithlessness and their rebellion would surely make him uh, cut them off at some point. But it's not about them. God's covenantal love for his people is based on his own character, his own mercy and grace. And that means that even their sin will not make God forsake his people. Think of what God's doing there. Yeah, he's um, telling them how bad their sin is, how sinful they are. He's making them fear because of their sin so that he can give them grace and restore their relationship with himself. We must understand our rebellion to know God's grace for rebels. God has grace for rebels. Now, some of us are highly introspective people. You look back at your sin and you count all of the ways in which you should have done better. Or you sit in your sin. You wallow in it. Maybe it's a repetitive sin and you just feel like you have to muster up feelings of guilt until you feel bad enough about it so that you can finally repent. And you think that like the way to, to, to grow and, and not sin again is, is just by mustering up feelings of guilt, feeling bad enough about it so that I won't do it again. But if you only look at yourself, and if you only look at the horror of your sin, you actually view yourself wrongly. God rightly makes us afraid of our sin, but then he says, do not be afraid. Do not turn your gaze from the Lord. He says, Don't turn back after empty things that cannot profit and cannot deliver. He declares grace for sinners. So who are you to declare that Jesus' Jesus work is is not enough for you? That his sacrifice on the cross is not sufficient for for you? It's actually enormously self-justifying to deny the sufficiency of Christ's work by saying, no, but my sin is worse. My sin is worse this time. I can't go back to him anymore. I can't draw near to God. And then to reject God's word in Christ of do not fear, to turn aside from the Lord and look only to yourself. God does not forsake his people. Consider how everything Samuel's declared to them up to this point is really God's kindness to, to them, confronts them with their sin, He gives rain and thunder to make them fear God. And then his words, do not fear, forgiving them of their sin, holding out grace, restoring their relationship with himself. God does even more. He wipes the slate clean, but God's got even more grace for them. You you could ask the question of like, hey, if God only forgives my sin, won't I just fall into sin again? Um, when we just, yeah, when we just rebel again, and aren't Israel going to fall into the same, the same old patterns and just end up more and more helpless? So God, what God does is he takes something they desired for evil, and he's going to use that for something good. Even though their demands for a king were rebellious, God actually provides a king to lead them. And then in verses 14 and 15, he reminds them of the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. This reads a lot like the blessings for obedience uh, that were supposed to be read from Mount Gerizim and the curses for disobedience that were to be read to the people um, from Mount uh, Ebal. 
But now God modifies the, con- the, the terms. He modifies the conditions for blessing and for curses to include the role of the king. So let me read um, verse 14 and 15. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. The king's role is to lead them. There's twofold, right? The king's role, he's, he's to lead them in obedience to God's commands, and he's a representative for Israel. If the king is faithful, the people share in his blessing. If the king rebels, the people share in the curse. So this is like a high-stakes game of Mosaic Covenant. It's like we put all our chips on this one guy who's, who's going to represent us. The people are blessed for the king's obedience, or they're cursed for the king's rebellion. So God, God provides this king. Uh, he renews the covenant, provides the king. He also gives a prophet and priest here. They ask Samuel to pray for them, and Samuel promises. He says, he's like, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. Samuel will stand before God for them like a priest and pray. Pray for their obedience. Pray for the king. Pray for their standing before God. And as a prophet, he's going to teach them God's law so they can walk in obedience. God is, God is really providing them um, so much here. He's, 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 he's at work not to forsake his people. Renews the covenant with them. So he restores the relationship. He provides a king to lead them in God's ways. And he gives a prophet and priest to teach God's law and pray for them. And then, if we look at the last couple of verses, to match the thunder of the text, our passage gives a final warning to them from verses 24 and 25. He says, Only fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things He's done for you. But... If you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Now, I've been saying throughout the sermon that God will not forsake his people. I've been telling you that over and over again. He won't forsake his people to the enemy, nor to themselves. And you might look at the conditionality of that last term and think, hey, if you still do wickedly, you'll be swept away. You might think, hey, how can that be so? How can God not forsake his people if he might still sweep them away. So which is it? Will God not forsake them, or is God going to sweep them away, them and their king, for their sins? Well, both can be true. It depends on who their king is. The very next chapter, spoiler, Saul fails hard. He does not obey God. He's a king just like the rest of the people, and just like Israel Saul disobeys God and rebels against his command. And Saul is swept away. And eventually, many generations later, Israel is swept away as a nation too. But God does not forsake his people. God's given us a better king. Not the king we would choose. This king's rule is like no other. Jesus served the Lord perfectly with his whole heart. He would not turn aside from obedience to God, even from the cross. The cross was so disgraceful, the Romans reserved it only for certain criminals. When Pilate put Jesus on trial, he gave the crowd a choice. He would either release Jesus or Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was an insurrectionist. Barabbas was a rebel. And what happened there is, Barabbas went free, and Jesus went to the cross instead. He died in the stead of an insurrectionist. Jesus was judged in the place of rebels against God. This is the curse. The Lord demands for disobedience, death, judgment for our sins. And our king suffered that curse in our place. Jesus represents his people and dying for sinners. At the same time, Jesus represents his people in his perfect obedience. His righteousness is credited to us. His perfect record becomes our standing before God. 
And so Jesus' people are blessed because of our king's obedience. Now, if you don't know this king, this king who offers to take your place, to die in your stead, his righteousness is freely offered to to you. Jesus offers you himself. Whatever you have done, you can have this king represent you before God. How can you receive him? We cry out, cry out to this king. One of the words this this passage uses over and over again is, is to serve him. What I mean by that is not like, hey, we serve him and we have to obey him and make sure we're good enough um, through our service. It's not that. When I say serve him, I mean like switch allegiance. We recognize I've rebelled against this king, but no more. Jesus is king, and we trust in him as our representative now before God. Now, what if I'm a Christian here and I've failed again and again? I failed to obey God over and over again. And I, I just feel like, hey, I'm, I, I'm, I'm such a rebel. I am struggling so much in my sin, and I, I just fall into the same, the same sin over and over again. Is there any hope for me that I can change? Are we just like the people in Saul's time, given a clean slate, given a slightly better king, a king who, who offers to take our place, but unchanged hearts? No. Can you see from our passage, that God does everything for salvation. God comes in and does it all, represented by a better king. Jesus died on the cross. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. He's ascended, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's a better priest. He prays not from somewhere in the wilderness, the way a prophet like Samuel would, but he prays from the right hand of God, interceding for us, pointing to his blood as evidence of our righteousness is evidence that God must save and deliver us because he has done it all. He prays for us right to the very end. And he's a prophet, not someone who's just gonna teach us God's law and then tell us to serve the Lord with all our heart. Jesus comes and he's a prophet who comes to give us a new heart. He gives us a new heart, a heart that's actually grieved by sin. He writes his law on our hearts. He writes his gospel on our hearts. If you're discouraged, you feel like you're never going to change, take heart. Jesus intercedes until we're saved to the uttermost. How, do we, how are we going to respond today? Um, we've heard that, we, that God does not forsake us. He doesn't forsake us to our enemies, nor to ourselves. The, the natural response is, is to respond by serving, serving this king. The people of Samuel's day needed to be disciplined by fear. We've got a better reason to serve the king. We serve this king because he does not forsake us. He's always with us. He comes and he's done it all for us. So maybe I think we can think about that, this response, how we serve Jesus um, with three C's. I haven't put them on the slide. Um, unfortunately. So you have to remember, the first C is covenant, covenant renewal. If we're in Christ, we belong to a new covenant. We're sealed by his blood. What does covenant renewal look like today? We don't have to go to Gilgal. We go straight to Jesus, and we renew. We renew our allegiance to him. If there's an area of your life that we're living in, and we know that, hey, Jesus really isn't king, over this area, I've, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surrendering this to him, that, then we bring that to him and we say, Jesus, be king. I'm struggling to trust you in this area, but Jesus, give me strength. Show me how your rule is better. Show me how your rule is better um, than, than, than the idols that I'm serving at the moment. We've got such a great salvation. He calls us to serve him. Make Jesus king again. So cov- part of covenant renewal then, um, so we renew our allegiance to him. Um, part of it, though, is, is, is repentance. The second C is, is confession. So the second response, confess our sins. God's given us new hearts, hearts of flesh that can be shaped by his word. But how do we change? It's through confessing our sins to Jesus, confessing the ways that we fall short, that we fail to trust in his work. If there's, if there's ways in which we're usurping Jesus authority in our lives, let's be quick to confess our sins. God really changes us slowly but surely through that process. And we can think about it. If the blessing 
for obedience doesn't come through our own obedience, but it comes because of Christ's obedience, we've actually got no reason to hide in our sin anymore. We'll never justify ourselves anyway. This is it's freeing. It's freeing to approach God in Christ and just confess all of our sins to Him. Um, lay down the ways in which, in which we are not surrendering to Him. Lay down our, our sins after we've committed them, the darkest parts of ourselves. We don't need to justify ourselves because we're represented by Jesus. And finally, consider. Let's not stop at, at confess. I think sometimes we can think of confession in a way that is just like, or think of repentance in a way as just like, I just focus on my sin and, and I'm, 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 I'm dwelling on this and I have to feel really bad about it. Um, but consider, we confess, then we consider. Uh, Samuel says in the passage, consider what great things God has done for you. Consider what Christ has done for your salvation. Consider the man on the cross. Don't turn your gaze away from him. It can be tempting to turn aside from that, to look back, look back at our sin, to remain in that state of, 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 of confessing and, and, and dwelling on things. But that's not the place that deserves the most of your attention. Don't turn aside from Christ's sacrifice for you. Consider what a high price Jesus, your King, has paid for you. Let his accomplishments really, really sink in and rest in his finished work for you. Jesus cried out from the cross as he was dying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was forsaken in that moment instead of us. That is your promise that God will never forsake us. Not to our enemy, not even to ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that we have such a king. I pray in this moment as we think about covenant renewal, that you would renew us in the sufficiency of Christ's work and your achievements for us in the sense that Christ has, has really done everything for our salvation. God, I pray that you give us eyes to consider Jesus, to consider Christ's work as sufficient to cover the whole of us. And God, give us faith today that you do not forsake your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.